Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause sin will inevitably occur, but woe to the one through whom they occur. It would be better for him if a millstone were put around his neck and he be thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of the little ones to sin. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he wrongs you seven times in one day, and returns to you seven times saying, I am sorry, you should forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. The Lord replied, If you have the faith of the size of a mustard seed, you would say to this to the mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The first matter of today's gospel is the scandals. The Lord recognizes it impossible for them to happen due to the sinful nature of man, wounded by the original sin. It is impossible for there to be no scandals, but the Lord says, We must try to ensure that there are none. Above all, He says to the most serious thing in the sin is scandal. It's the ones against the little ones. He who scandalizes one of these little ones it would be better for him for a milestone to be put around his neck and he be thrown into the sea. We must think, it is inevitable to do so, about the abuse of minors. It is something awful. It is something that the church has suffered and it's suffering, for which he asks for forgiveness and he does it. The scandals, the abuse of minors are a tragedy, in which in the first place he has the minor as a victim but then has the entire body of the church as a victim. However, we must remember those words that Pope Benedict XVI, that the Pope Emeritus, he said in the letter he wrote to all the bishops, presidents of the Episcopal Conferences, who were gathered in Rome to speak precisely about the issue of children abuse. In that letter, the Pope, as the Pope Emeritus already said, he told the bishops that there was not only physical abuse, let's say psychological abuse of the minor, with an abuse not only sexual, but abuse of authority, abuse of power, but there also existed doctrinal abuse. Because it is an abuse of a minor, Pope Benedict said, that it was an abuse not only to a child, but also to an adult who does not have sufficient information. It is an abuse for that man or that child to be taught doctrine contrary to the teaching of the church as if the teaching of the church. Pope Benedict said, it is an abuse. He asked the bishops to be vigilant. The word bishop means precisely that, vigilant. He who watches to be complete transmission of the faith. He asked them to be vigilant, not only against the abuse of children, which is very worst, but also against the abuse of children and adults, but from the perspective of teaching the wrong doctrine. The emphasis is set on sexual abuse of minors. It is very serious. I don't intend to compare one with the other, but we must not forget those other continuous abuses, liturgical abuses, abuses that are committed when the priest in the gesture of dictatorial clericalism prevents the faithful from doing what they have the right to do, for example, receiving communion in the mouth. Doctrinal abuses when the opposite of what the church teaches is taught in catechisms, to children in homilies, or when the opposite of what the church teaches is practiced. The gospel has more things. It says, if your brother offends you, reproach him. Okay, if he repents, you forgive him. And if he offends you seven times a day, and seven times again he tells you again, I repent, you have to forgive him. There's an important thing here. If he repents, he says. What about if he doesn't repent? Is it hard enough if he repents? What about if he doesn't repent? Do you have to forgive the one who does not repent? Let us see what God does with us. It is not even possible to imagine that God does not forgive us. Yet, 
if we don't repent, we are not forgiven. This is an important, important distinction. One thing is the forgiveness that is given, and another thing is the forgiveness that is received. The forgiveness that is given comes from the victim. The forgiveness that is received is the one responsible, the aggressor. You have to forgive always, always. The one who has hurt you will not receive your forgiveness if he does not repent, but forgiveness has already come from you. God's forgiveness is always on your skin. Only when we open the door to our heart do we allow him to enter. Why? Because God does not want to violate us. He does not want to force our will. He respects our freedom. He wants us to forgive. He forgives us. He has already forgiven us. But we do not receive such forgiveness until we say to ourselves, I am sorry. I'm sorry. That's our problem, not his. It is not God's problem. It is not the victim's problem. It's the aggressor's problem. It is a problem of the one who has offended. However, what happens when the victim forgives? He recuperates peace. He no longer has resentment within. He no longer has hatred within, which poisons his soul and hurts him. They hurt him with the offense, but he hurts yourself by not forgiving. You chew on the offense, think about it, and ruminate on it. You become poisoned, remembering the offense, which was surely true, but now it is up to you for you to continue hurting you. That is why the Lord, not only for the good of our neighbor, and this is what we have to understand, it is for our own good, who tells us, forgive. Heal yourself from the wound that has been done to you. Forgive you for forgive for your own good. Forgive. Forgive. Don't feed resentment within you. Forgive. The other will or will not receive your forgiveness and he will not receive it if he does not repent. It is his problem. But you are already freed from the damage that he has done to you. Don't let it poison your blood, chewing and churning over the offense that has been done to you over and over again. Forgive. And even if it's possible, forget. If possible, but it's even an effort to forget. It is very significant that after saying this, after saying that we have to forgive up 70 times 7, the apostles don't tell Jesus, increase our love, but increase our faith. Why did the faith? We think that the faith is an intellectual matter. It is a matter of believing some dogmas. Yet the apostles are right when they say, increase our faith. Because first, faith is linked to works. It is linked to life. Second, faith has an effective dimension, which is trust. Increase our faith, Lord. Increase our trust in you, so that we trust in your words, so that we trust that what you teach us is the best. What is best for the world? For there to be peace is the best for families, which curls are forgotten. But it is the best for me. It is the best for me. I want to trust you, Lord. And I know that you, when you're asking me to forgive, you're asking it not only for a matter of the attacker, you're asking it for me because it is not, because it is good for me to forgive. Therefore, Lord, increase my love and increase my faith that precedes love. May it be so.